Good afternoon, everyone. Our guest today is my friend, the President of the Illinois Senate. After serving 12 years in the House, he was elected in 1992 to the Senate and became its President in November of 2008. He's a graduate of Loyola University and Loyola University Law School. He and his wife, Pam, are the proud parents of five beautiful children. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, the President of the Illinois Senate, John Cullerton. Thank you very much, Tony. I know that there's so many elected officials here that Jay didn't want to take the time to introduce them, but I have to make a couple of exceptions. First of all, I'd like to introduce the person who helped me write my speech, my wife, Pam Cullerton. <clears throat> and I was able to see there's people here who actually vote for me. So I want to introduce them. Senator Staines is here. Senator Harmon is here. I'm, I'm uh, Sarah, I'm not introducing anybody from the House. Are there any other state senators here? OK. When you go to the Senate, what well, if you go to the Senate, then I wouldn't be in the Senate. So that's not, that's not going to happen, OK? Senator Mulrow, is he here? Senator Mulrow, OK. So shy. Thank you. And one other person I'm going to introduce, only because it's our daughter, Josephine's godmother. She's running for office tomorrow. Her name is Mary Jane Tice, running for the Supreme Court. <clears throat> now, let me tell you how much fun I had here last year. I talked about the state budget. I talked about the way we bring money into the state. It was meant to be informational. At one point in time, I mentioned in passing something that many people didn't know, and that is that in Illinois, we do not tax retirement income. Illinois does not tax retirement income, one of the very few states that does that. So after the speech, I was approached by the media, <clears throat> and the first question was, tell us about your plan to tax the seniors. <laughs> I said, I don't have a plan to tax the seniors. Well, but I thought you said, so we went down to Springfield in the afternoon, Rakesha Falan, my press secretary, we got down there, all over the state, there's this story about Cullerton wants to tax the seniors, okay? So I said, well, we better send a press release out saying, that's not true. I didn't say that. So we did. So the next day, the headline was, Cullerton backtracks from taxing his plan. <laughs> so the city club doesn't tell you what to talk about, so uh, I want to be very careful. And so I'm really kind of happy that Governor... Romney is over at the University of Chicago because most of the media is over there, so maybe they won't ask me any questions. I think Mr. Senator, or Governor Romney is over there. I think he's talking about explaining how Romney care is totally different from Obamacare. <laughs> totally different. It's nothing like it. The other guy that was in town, one of my favorite governors, he was here campaigning for Romney, and that was Governor Christie from the highest tax state in the nation, New Jersey, coming here to probably do some shopping here in Illinois <laughs> because the taxes are lower. So thank you, Governor Christie, for showing. <clears throat> so I was worried about what to talk about and you know, not get in trouble. So we took a lot of time with our staff to figure out a topic that would hold your interest. We had some pretty exciting ideas. Um, my chief counsel said, let's talk about the White Sox, OK? Um, my new communications director, he said, the power of social media and government, that would be something to talk about. My political director said, obviously, let's talk about the election. That's tomorrow. And of course, my press secretary um, said, uh, maybe you shouldn't even come here. And don't, don't, so, <clears throat> so despite all those options, I ultimately made the executive decision to talk about something even more exciting, which will surely keep you on the edge of your seat. Now, before I say this, I got to tell you, um, well, let me just tell you what it is. It'll keep you on the edge of your seat. We're going to talk about <clears throat> pensions. Oh, my God, look at this. 
If, if you could just see the bored look on your faces. I don't think I've ever seen this before. Two people just took their cell phone out to make sure it was on. <laughs> they they want to get a call during this. Well, let's, let's see. My wife tells me that it might be a little boring, but these fancy pie charts and bar graphs will help you get through this, all right? So what are we going to talk about today? Um, allow me to discuss how our pension system works, kind of a pensions 101, how badly funded they are, how they got this way, uh, the Constitution of the state of Illinois, how it fits in here, and what we've done to improve the pension system and what I think we can do, okay? So, the state is the employer, the employer for five state pension systems. These systems manage retirement systems for the state's public universities and community colleges, the General Assembly and the judges, those two are pretty small, the downstate and suburban teachers, and the state agency employees. The state also sets benefit levels for numerous levels of municipal government, but we're not considered the employer. <clears throat> now, funding pensions is like paying for college. Either you pay as you go, or you establish a savings account and put money in, in advance. Pension funding, however, is not a four-year, or perhaps in our case, a five-year commitment, as it would be with our children. It's, um, <laughs> it's perpetual. Uh, pensions are not only a key component of employee compensation, but they also allow public servants to have economic security upon retirement. Now, pension funding derives from three sources, employee contributions, employer contributions, and investment income. The most stable source of funding is employee contributions, with the amounts determined as a flat percentage of each employee's income. Investment income is at the other end of the funding spectrum, subject as it is to various market forces within the economy. Employer contributions or contributions from the state appropriations fall somewhere in between, determined through the budgetary process in accordance with available resources. The state's pensions plans are defined benefit plans, so active employees know what retirement income they can anticipate and count on. Defined contribution plans are prevalent among the private sector. They do not guarantee a certain level of retirement benefit. Defined contribution plans carry a risk associated with the market. Under current law, public sector employees pay taxes like everybody else. The state takes a portion of their taxes and pays the employer portion to the pension fund. In addition, the employees make their own contributions out of their paychecks. So if you switch to a 401k, there are tremendous startup costs. You would lose all of the employee contributions to the pension systems, and the taxpaying public would then be left to pick up that financial burden. And that transition wouldn't do anything to attack our current $83 billion liability. It's also important to remember that for a good portion of active employees and retirees, the state's defined benefit program is their only retirement plan. Why? Because teachers, university professors, community college employees, and certain state employees, like state policemen, do not participate in Social Security. The state's pension plan is their safety net. Given those folks, the task of managing a risky, defined contribution pension may mean that at retirement, their pension savings may not keep up with the cost of living. So, <clears throat> how badly funded are we? Look at this chart. Teachers' retirement system, 46%. State universities' retirement, 45%. State employees, 34%. The judges, 31%. General Assembly, this over 20%. Now, in order to make up for this funding shortfall, we are obligated to pay more money into the pension systems, and that is having an effect on our ability to balance the budget. <clears throat> so in 2006, the pension costs were less than 3% of our budget. But this year, they are more than 15%. So to put things in additional perspective, revenues for this year are up about $500 million from last year but pensions alone are projected to cost an additional $1 billion. So, how do we get so badly funded? <clears throat> Among the reasons we find ourselves in the situation we're in is that Illinois takes on far more responsibility for public sector pensions than other states. Nowhere is this more evident than with the suburban and downstate teachers' retirement system known as the TRS. In Illinois, these local school district employees are considered state employees 
when it comes to retirement. The local school boards and administrators set the salaries, do the hiring, but it's the state budget that deals with the pension cost. That's not the situation in most other states. On top of that, even within Illinois, the Chicago School District is treated differently and gets virtually nothing from the state for its pension fund. That is inherently unfair. Now what we have here is a situation where the state sends billions of dollars to suburban and downstate school districts and they turn around and send the state the bill for their employees' pension costs. It wasn't that long ago that the state education budget included pension funding as education spending. If the state spent more on teachers' pensions, it was considered increased spending on education. That didn't change till about 2003 when the two were split out in the budget process. But I think it's important to keep in mind, since the budget we're putting together for next year spends $2.7 billion on suburban and downstate teachers' pensions, a $300 million increase over this year. So that's $300 million that could be otherwise go to increasing money for classrooms. Now, if we can just briefly look at the history of the underfunding. <clears throat> Our fiscal policy regarding pensions has actually never fully funded the five state pension systems. Uh, this chart shows the pension system's funding level from 1968 to 2011. The top line, by the way, is 80%. What should the funding level be, by the way? 100% funding would, would assume that we would need enough cash on hand for Comptroller Topinka to mail enough checks to every state employee if they all decided to retire on the same day. That's 100%. That's simply not going to happen. But we do need to ensure we're on a long-term path towards fiscal security for our pension systems. Just as a point of reference, if you look on that chart, at the time of the 1970 Constitutional Convention, the five state pension systems had a combined funding ratio of 41.8% which is actually lower than the current funding ratio of 43.3. So the problem's been around for a long time. So let's take a closer look at this TRS. This is, this is how much money we've given to the TRS as opposed to how much we should have given. And it goes back to 1940 to the present. Now the important to look at, the green line at the top, that's 100%. That shows the teachers have always paid what they've been required to contribute, 9.4% of their salary. But of course, it's been a different story as it relates to the state contributions. So it, we shouldn't be surprised as to why funding was so low, because in 1953 to 72, the state pension contributions were tied to no specific funding policy. Then in 1973 to 1981, the state made contributions based on a policy of paying 100% of what the pension systems were expected to pay out. So this policy, while not actuarially sound, because it wasn't 100%, it allowed the pension systems, though, to bank employee contributions and investment returns, which helped reduce unfunded liabilities. That was our funding policy until March of 1981, when Governor Thompson announced that Illinois would take a one-year holiday from the 100% payout policy in fiscal year 1982. That one year holiday became a new funding policy of the state, contributing roughly only 60%, not 100% of payout to the pension systems. Comptroller Topinka herself stated in May of last year that this shift in policy aggravated our funding problem. Now, in 1983, here's the dilemma Governor Thompson had. His budget was $300 million short of being balanced. So he proposed shortening, shorting the pension systems by $90 million to help close the gap. The teachers' unions began an aggressive campaign against this idea. Thompson offered them a deal. He said, drop your opposition or I'll take the $90 million out of your education funding. So I don't mean to pick on Governor Thompson because I too was there and I voted for a lot of budgets that didn't fully fund the pension contribution. It's ha but it's happened routinely over the past several decades as general assemblies and governors made decisions for what was happening then, not what might come down the road. Now, back to our chart. In August of 1994, we passed a law putting the state's five systems on a funding schedule meant to get all systems to 90% funded by 2045. This law passed in response to concerns that there was no plan to ensure that the systems will remain solvent for future retirees. 
It was also a concern at the time that the plan would impose immediate cost on the state budget in the mid to late 90s. So lawmakers at the time fashioned a plan designed to phase it in. This heralded pension funding law was supposed to ramp up state payments over 15 years, at which point they'd become a stable and predictable set level of state payroll. Unfortunately, the law never delivered the plan stability. Too little was paid in during those initial 15 years, resulting in the unfunded liability increasing by $57 billion. You know, ideally, the goal of a funding plan is not to double your debt, but that's what happened under the plan. Now, Governor Blagojevich, in, in 2003, with approval from the General Assembly, borrowed $10 billion for the state's pension systems at about a 5% interest rate, and the plan was to reinvest it in the funds and make 8% interest over the next 30 years. Not a bad idea. The problem was that since the state needed the money that year, he only put $7.3 billion of that $10 billion back into the funds. That's effectively skipping the payment. The General Assembly borrowed money to make our pension payments for fiscal year 10 and 11. So while these short-term solutions ensured that the systems received the funding, do them, now we have to pay it back. So we have a big hill leading into fiscal year 12. <clears throat> now, you probably can't see th that small, but let me tell you what it is. This chart shows the cause of why the state's pension systems are so underfunded. Pension benefit increases and employee salary increases are not the main reasons why our pension system liabilities have grown, as some have claimed. Between fiscal year 83 and 2010, our state's pension system liabilities grew by $68.5 billion. 48% of that growth came from the General Assembly's failure to properly contribute to the pension systems. Only 2% came from salary increases and 11% from benefit increases. Now, this next chart shows you what's happened since fiscal year 2007. Uh, the state's unfunded liabilities grew by another $33.5 billion, with 53% of that growth coming to investment losses. And 26% of that growth was due to shortfalls in state contributions. So in short, the problem confronting our pension system is one of funding and stems primarily from the General Assembly's failure to properly fund the system. This was well known back in 1970 when the pension clause of the Constitution was adopted and remains so today. So let me talk to you briefly about the Constitution. This is the section that deals with pensions. Membership in any pension or retirement system of the state, any unit of local government or school district, or any agency or instrumental thereof, shall be an enforceable contractual relationships, the benefit of which shall not be diminished or impaired. Illinois courts say the pension clause prohibits the General Assembly from unilaterally reducing the pension benefit rights of current employees and retirees. The pension clause does this by safeguarding the pension benefit rights contained in this Illinois pension code when a person joins the public pension system. This protection, I believe, extends to employee contribution rates and any benefit increases added during the employee's term of service. While the clause prohibits the General Assembly from unilaterally reducing pension benefit rights, the rights are contractual in nature. So pension benefit rights can be changed if the General Assembly offers public employees something of real value and public employees agree to accept that offer. Uh, Illinois cannot simply welsh on its pension promises to public servants. The law is clear in this point based on the clause's plain language, the drafter's original intent, the voters' understanding of the provision when they ratified it, as well as court decisions interpreting the clause. Now, there have been some recent efforts to change our pension systems. I don't believe they're going to work. Senate Bill 512 was offered by uh, House Republican leader Tom Cross as a pension reform. The bill would require active employees uh, to pay, admittedly, significantly higher contributions that are cost prohibitive simply to keep the current level of pension benefits. Uh, it's kind of like making a, a, taking a fixed rate mortgage and making it into an adjustable rate mortgage where the rate could only go up. You know, not such a great deal. So I believe the bill is unconstitutional because it attempts to take away rights without the employee getting anything in return. Now, you may not have read this in the newspaper, but we have done 
something to improve our pension systems, and, and uh, this is important. In 2010, the General Assembly passed the most serious comprehensive pension reform bill in Illinois history, and according to the legislature's independent bipartisan economic agency, it will save over a quarter of a trillion dollars in the next three decades. This chart shows how much less the state left to pay in for new hires. The reform package essentially created a new tier by adjusting the requirements and the benefits for nearly all public employees who are hired on or after January 1st, 2011. So it increases the retirement age to 67, replaces the compounded 3% annual cost of living adjustment with a fairer COLA that reflects economic reality. It requires that a retiree's benefit be calculated over an eight-year period, and it establishes a cap to the final average salary that mirrors Social Security. So the good news is that there are some additional reforms that could be made which are constitutional. Pension benefit rights are contractual in nature, which means these rights can be modified under contract principles of offer, consideration, and acceptance. So by way of example, the legislature could offer public employees a contractually binding funding schedule, not what we've been doing over the years of underfunding, but a contractually binding funding schedule in exchange for public employees accepting a reduction in their current compounded COLA to a simple COLA. Put differently, public employees could be asked to accept a lower COLA upon retirement in exchange for the state to guarantee a funding schedule of the pension system to stabilize it. This change would reduce pension cost now and our unfunded pension liabilities as well to free up more money to potentially be spent on education and paying our old bills. So if we look at this chart, this shows you the savings to the system if you change from a compounded COLA to a simple COLA. So the compounded COLA is red, the simple COLA is the line below that. We, now we know people are gonna be living longer so let's take a state employee who's 30 years old now and retires at the age of 60 with a 3% compounded COLA and a $50,000 pension. The annual the annuity grows to $121,000 uh, per year at the age of 90 in comparison to $95,000 if it's a simple COLA. So over that, the gap between those two lines, over that 30-year uh, span, that retiree is entitled to a quarter of a million dollars more in benefits because of it's a compounded COLA. This is very expensive to the pension system. The bottom line is that employees must have a real opportunity to accept or reject the General Assembly's offer in order to pass constitutional muster. With that said, the General Assembly may build incentives to encourage employees to accept the offer. Once again, the TRS, that 21% there, that $2 billion, that is how much the state is paying in for suburban and downstate teachers only, not Chicago. I believe that it's time to ask local school districts outside Chicago to have some skin in the game in terms of paying for their employee retirement benefits. We wouldn't ask them to pick up any of the, la of the past underfunding. We're only talking about the normal cost going forward, nor would we make such a switch overnight. There are numerous considerations and calculations that would have to occur, but it's time that they did as our current situation is clearly not fair to anybody. So there you have it. We've discussed how our pension systems work, how badly funded they are, how they've got to be this way, and uh, we've talked about the Constitution, and how we have improved our pension systems and can achieve reforms in a constitutional way. Now the governor has convened a pension working group where everyone's at the table, they are set to issue their report on April 17th. It's my hope that the effective parties are working in good faith to achieve reforms that allow the state to pay less while stabilizing and securing our pension system. Thank you very much for your time. So, Mr. Green. If we can answer questions on pensions instead of taxing seniors, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Jin, Ms. City Club B is there. Raise your hand if you want to write a question or you've written a question. 
Uh, we have to get some more. Any students in the crowd? They're used to asking any retired pr professors. Ms. Alter, I see you out there. Well, Professor Green has a couple of questions. Got to start the ball rolling. In fact, the ball may be already stopped. How, I'll, I'll be on your left. How in the world are you going to convince Collar County and downstaters who have to kick in for their own pensions after all these years of not paying a dime? How are those local school boards going to react to this? And more importantly, how are those voters going to react in statewide elections coming up in 2014? It, it does not necessarily require a property tax increase to ask the suburban and downstate school districts to do what we've been doing in Chicago all this time. The next time you negotiate a contract with the teachers, you tell the teachers that, hey, the law's been changed. We've got to start paying in to your own pension system some money. And it may be in the teachers' best interest when they see the history of the state underfunding them to actually have the school districts be obligated to do that. So I'm not uh, dismissing the, op the, the possibility of getting the support of the teachers' unions from doing this. We would phase it in, we have, but we have to start. And that's what the goal is. And hopefully it would be part of the bigger package that I described where we can uh, reform the whole, all the systems, not just the teachers. Um, I could keep asking questions, but that's not my role. Joshua Schwartz, where are you? Raise your hand. I can barely see you, Joshua, but if you keep asking good questions, you'll be moving on up. Here we go. <laughs> Since changing pension benefits require employee agreement and shared sacrifice on all school side, on all sides, employer, blah, 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 is required, how can all these groups come together? Well, as I said, the, the, the proposition is you're going to get something for giving up your future pension benefit. If we take the COLA, for example, you're still going to get a, a, a COLA. You saw the line that showed a steady increase. It's just not the compounded COLA. And that's 30 years from now if you're 30 years old or, thir or more. Sacrifice that right now. Our state budget won't have to put over $5 billion into the pension funds. So if you're AFSCME and you're negotiating new contracts with the state right now, you're, there'll be more money available for you to argue should go to your, your salaries because it's not so much as going to the pension fund. The same thing with the teachers. We could pay, we are behind in paying our bills to the school districts. We can pay our bills to the school districts. We can put more money in the school fund if the pension costs are not so high. So we're asking the unions, it's not Wisconsin or Ohio, we don't not talk to the unions, we're sitting down and negotiating with them. And we're asking them to look at the big picture. We also have, in my uh, view of this, an obligation to give them something. So they get something for this, otherwise it's not a contract. And they have to accept it. So we put incentives in there, like our guarantee that we're going to fund these pension systems in the future. And if we don't, you can sue us, almost like a bondholder can sue to get their bond repaid. That's, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but obviously this is something I think it's time to confront because otherwise we can't sustain this. Well, we have a late arrival question, but since it's from Charlie Gardner, uh, that's a great question. Do you give the same speech in suburban Chicago and downstate? <laughs> Yes, Charlie, I, I, I do, and it's, it's uh, as you know, there's a lot of folks that like to run against Chicago. It really works very well. We even have some of our own Democrats running against Chicago uh, downstate, so we know there's always been this. But when you tell them this anomaly about the state paying virtually nothing into the Chicago pension system and $2.5 billion into theirs, they really have a hard time uh, disagreeing with the concept. They just say, well, yeah, but how are we going to do it? And, and so that's when we can sit down and work with them. I don't think anybody can really, uh, with a straight face, say that it's fair. It's just that we have to figure out a way to, to allow them over time to make, start making those payments. Uh, just think if the Republicans had the remap. Uh, you could have been a stretched way up there. Uh, Sandy Blau, where are you? 
Okay, there's Sam. I always... Good question. What is your opinion of the recent story about one state university, Eastern, in beautiful Charleston, extending pension coverage to contractors? Isn't that anti-reform? Well, there's no question that there's other uh, abuses of the pension system that people have read about that we have responded to with corrective legislation. Uh, and the question is, who should be uh, eligible to even be a member of the, of the, of the unit? that benefits from the pensions. And that's something which we can continue to investigate and continue to legislate on. But I, the point of my slides here is to show that the real, real cost uh, to the system are not those abuses. They still should be corrected. We still should be uh, re-examined. But the real cost has been two things. The TRS is over 50% of the total problem, and in 36 other states, the, the state wouldn't even have the obligation. And the second is we have chronically underfunded these things for so many years. And then recently the stock market uh, didn't help at all. That's the big problem that we have that we're trying to confront. But those uh, issues can still be examined. We can st we're still in session and we can still address them. Uh, we have a question from uh, Professor Sharon Alter, formerly of Harper Community College. You propose a contractually binding funding schedule by State of Illinois. If, if imposed, is that the word? If imposed, if, oh, if, if it passes, Illinois has not adequately funded pensions in the past, how can Illinois be trusted to comply with your proposal? Okay, well actually, in the last few years, we have funded the pensions. If we pass these reforms, we won't owe as much money into the pension systems. And even in the years when we had the huge drop in revenues to the state, the two years of the, of the recession, even then we felt it was more responsible to borrow money at relatively low interest rates and put them into the pensions and not skip the payments. So actually I think we can uh, make the commitment going forward to fund these pension systems, but only if it's part of the big package where we reduce the future benefits, reduce the unfunded liability, and reduce the amount of money that we have to put in. If we do that, we can be obligated to do so. Two more questions and, and we'll be done. Uh, this is from Tom Lee. Where are you, Tom? Rather brief question. Is bankruptcy an option? Um, I don't believe so. I, I think that the um, uh, state uh, is obligated to make these payments. Uh, and, you know, I, hopefully, It'll never be something we ever even have to deal with. I believe that when people see the facts here, and there's a lot of stuff here I, I suspect that you, you didn't even know about. When we educate folks about this, including the, the public employees, that we will have a deal. So uh, I, I hope that it, uh, we, we never have to even worry about that word. But right now, we're, at the, we're, we're, we're taking so much money out of the general revenue fund, and it's, until we do something, we're going to just make it so more difficult to fund our our education system, pay for the Medicaid cost, and so I, I think we'll never have to get to that, but I think the fact is the state's always going to be obligated, and that's what's going to push us to, to find a solution. We have a question from Myrna Mazur. Where, oh, there you are. I didn't, I didn't see you there. Now, you may have to help me with this one, Ms. Mazur. Will reciprocal funding among systems be affected by future changes to individual system? I'm not sure I understand. Why don't you repeat the question? Yeah. Well, she's talking about the fact that we have reciprocity if you serve in more than one uh, system. We do have reciprocity. That's in the category of benefit benefits that, uh, again, uh, we, we feel that once the benefits are accumulated, you can't, uh, you can't lose them unless you voluntarily give them up. Uh, that's not where the money is. The money, if you want to save money for this system, it's in, number one, changing from a compounded cola to a simple cola. Number two, making folks work a little bit longer before they get their maximum benefit. Those two things is where the, where the money is. It's not even requiring people to pay more in. It's simply, uh, uh, and, and those benefits, we hope people would agree to give up because there's so much further in the future in exchange for a more stable system. So the, so the, the point is to your reciprocity issue, it's a benefit 
It cannot be, uh, in my opinion, taken away unless it's agreed to. Uh, yeah, one quick point. If one went to Illinois Sen Senate Democrats com, will those charts be on online? It will be, because I think everybody here will want to re-examine those charts. How about a big round of applause for <laughs> the park on the budget? Right we got.